All right, all right, man. What's up, my people, man? We about to get right back into it, man. And what's up to my brother Tank? Tank about to get on here. We're about to go right into our chapter number three. Let me go ahead and put this link out here in the chat. Give me one second. And we'll continue on with our chapter three as we're going right through this full book, The Power Nomics, written by Dr. Claude Anderson. And let's get that rolling. All right, so give it a little bit of time. Let this one roll in. So we're going to start off with chapter three, which is part of, uh, which takes us into part two of the book. So part two is going to cover organizing for empowerment. And in this chapter three, this is building competitive communities. The nation will be colorblind when whites proclaim their black blood like they, procre like they proclaim Indian and European lineage. All right, so we'll get into this should be pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. So we'll go ahead and check this one out. Give us a few seconds. Let me get Tank in here real quick. And then I'll go ahead and start. And we're going to do our two sections of each chapter and, and keep, you know, kind of alternating between. All right, and once again, this is part of making reading cool again. Making that shit cool. Making it cool to be on a higher level of thinking, higher level of speaking, uh, uh, digging into higher level shit. All right, but I'm gonna go ahead and start. So I don't want to delay it too much longer. So I'm gonna go ahead and start and then me a tank of bounce back and forth. I need a pencil or something. Follow along. So let me see. Tank was saying the link. Okay, yeah, yeah, I had just dropped it there. All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and start tank. And let me see, hold on, let me put link in there one more time. One second. All right, here we go. All right, so here we go. So we'll start off with the first section of part two, organizing for empowerment. And this is in chapter three, building competitive communities. It says this nation will be colorblind when whites proclaim their black blood, like they proclaim their Indian and European lineage. A group's ability to compete is determined by its internal cohesive cohesiveness and self-interest. Black Americans must therefore build functional communities within. And we see got my brother Tank. And I'm we're gonna do the like we did yesterday and just alternate in between. All right, so I'm here on uh on the page 63. All right, so black Americans must therefore build functional communities within which they can ethno aggregate, which is the word we came across yesterday, ethno aggregate, then practice group ec economics and group politics. A functional community can best be defined as a grouping of people who come together and organize for their own self-interest rather than misdirected altruistic uh, interests. Out, out, uh, damn, I'm messing that up. Altruistic uh, interests once built, whether based upon geographical boundaries, et ethnics, or racial uh, commonalities, a community, a community cares for the collective interests of its members. Building our own communities will allow Black Americans to build economically and politically competitive, but all, will, will also give us something we have never had, a chance to compete from the vantage point of our own physical space, cultural values, resources, institutions, and history. For the first time, we will be free to organize and work in our own best interests rather than the interests of a universe of ethnic and class competitors. Historically, societies were built upon three institutions that serve as pillars, the family, the church, and the community. Two communities are, uh, two, uh, communities, are communities of mind and physical structures within a space. Both are important. But no traditional society built on land that did not that that it did not own or control has been successful or prospered. Neither the uh, landless European serfs nor the landless Jews under the pharaohs of Egypt were able to do it. For this for this reason, Black Americans need need a self. I'm uh, oh, sorry about that. Black Americans need a solid foundation of communities upon which to begin empowering ourselves. Like Moses, we must begin to build physical community, communities and maintain a strong sense of community. 
Moses used his vision of of a promise of the promised land to mobilize his people for 40 year or 40 year journey to a land upon which Jews built functional communities, families, religious institutions, commerce, schools, and a strong sense of community. Section two. I mean, not section two, but the next section. Boundary says boundary lines, the new color line. Nearly a century ago, W.E. Du Bois accurately proclaimed that the color line will be the problem of the 20th century. It's a new millennial now, and it is to be becoming clear that the problem of the 21st century will be community boundary lines. America is a balkanizing, all it says is balkanizing along racial, ethnic, economic, and religious lines across America. Groups are aggressively seeking territories or communities in which they can store their wealth, resources, and political power to ensure to enjoy and preserve their future generations. As noted earlier, Hispanics, for example, are assembling their economic and political intentions behind their Spanish language and culture. They intend to use both the capture territories, rights, and political base within the United States. The practice of seeking territories for communities will intensify as more and more people from around the world immigrate to America. They come to America and search for a better quality of life, not, the, not to integrate with whites or to get along with black Americans. They are coming to this country to get ahead economically and find wealth and fortune. They commit themselves to competing with any and all groups economically and politically on behalf of themselves, their families and their <clears throat> in their native countries. Typically, their initial and destination is close to or within black com black communities. They have learned from the from the officials and unofficial sources that they can find great opportunities in black neighborhoods. Within black neighborhoods, ethnic immigrants expect to find at least ex to find the least expensive housing, lacks enforce I mean lacks enforcement of laws and regulations and little business competition. They also find readily accessible consumers, government assistance, easy access to elected officials, and employment opportunities. Though they are aware of the crime problems in black neighborhoods. The advantages outweigh the disadvantages. They find territory and build communities. As ethnics fill, fill in the uh, business voids in black neighborhoods with a, uh, what is that, a modicum, uh, modicum of success, I'm jacking these words up, with a modicum of success, they begin to practice the ethno aggregation, says they, uh, says they bring in and aggregate their families and others from their native lands they then develop more businesses in the black neighborhoods as a capture territory. They establish powerful economies and uh, political organizations using their ethnic cultures, language and religion as a as their common ground. Watching how these new arriving immigrants use a sense of community to build social and economic power bases should be should be instructional for black Americans. It takes fully functional communities to raise a child and to raise up a competitive race of people. Neighborhoods are not enough. Neighborhoods are problematic for any group seeking empowerment. Unfortunately, most black Americans live in neighborhoods, not communities. A community signifies commitment and the potential for power. Nobody, um, sorry, neighborhoods does not. Webster's New World Dictionary defines neighborhood as a vicinity or physical place where there are people living near one another. The concept of a neighborhood implies an area that is residential in nature with a lesser wealth, power, and status than a community. The black, um, the majority of black Americans live in impoverished black neighborhoods and spend approximately 95% of their annual disposable income with people who live outside of the neighborhood. They spend only 5% of their disposable income in black neighborhoods. 
They spend 3% with non-Black owned businesses that are located in Black neighborhoods, but whose owners live outside of Black neighborhoods. Thus, only 2% of Black America's disposable income is spent in Black owned businesses in Black neighborhoods. It is impossible for a large population or neighborhood to be self-sufficient on only 2% of its income. By spending its disposable income in other groups, businesses, and communities. Black America impoverishes itself and impedes the growth of functional communities. One benefit of Jim Crow segregation was that it forced Blacks to build what could ap appropriately be called quasi-communities. Unlike neighborhoods where people simply live in the same area during Jim Crow segregation. Black Americans were unified with the code of conduct. They lived together because they had the same interests and needs, but equally as important, they trusted and depended on each other. From the Civil War until the end of the Black Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, Blacks successfully built a vibrant uh, culture marginally competitive schools, black churches, personal service businesses, and a professional class. Though they were small in number, these community assets produced jobs as well as products and services for black people. The desire for integration caused blacks to abandon their businesses, communities, culture, and the code of conduct the code of conduct. Black Americans need to be uh, accepted by white society was greater than their need to be accepted by black society. Today's black neighborhoods no longer qualify to even be called quasi communities because they no longer have a network of businesses or a group code of conduct. Today, black neighborhoods are primarily where the majority of black people eat and sleep. They do not embody the criteria for a functional community. Consequently, black neighborhoods are typically referred to as ghettos, urban areas, inner cities, or they are sometimes identified by terms such as the hood. These broad ambiguous terms signal the dependent non-competitive nature of black geographical areas across the country. Developing a true sense of community. What is a sense of community and why is it important? A sense of community is a collective thinking, seeing and behaving as a we, not as a me. Social integration has intensified our need for a strong sense of community or a sense of peoplehood. Having abandoned their quasi-communities, culture, schools, and businesses for the integration promised land, many Black Americans cannot easily return to physical communities that are primarily Black. Those who cannot return can exercise an option. They can identify with Black physical communities and organizations via their mindset, actions, and support. This strong identification and support is what is commonly referred to as a sense of community or sense of peoplehood. It is what people feel when they have a strong psychological identification with a physical community and its inhabitants. They are attracted to and desire the cultural familiarity, security, and satisfaction they receive from association with these communities. The psychological damage Blacks have experienced as a result of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and racism will pose significant challenges to developing a strong sense of community. All right. The impact of social engineering on communities. Throughout the relationship between Blacks and Whites, the majority white society has kept Black Americans under various forms of control 
physical, legal, and symbolic. The majority society through its primary institutions has used rudimentary sociological and uh, psychological principles to control blacks and deprive them of their sense of peoplehood. In such a state, black, pe black people could easily be misled into inappropriate behavior, Identif identifying with the oppressors groups and hating their own group. This is not a conspiracy theory. The facts are evident and the marked inequalities between the races and the continued inappropriate behavior patterns of black Americans. There is no other way to explain why historical inequalities remain unchanged and Black Americans continue to cede and surrender their wealth and resource powers to, the competitor, to their competitors while their own families, community, and the race as a whole remain powerless and impoverished. These are neither innate nor normal behavior characteristics. So let us examine their origins. Research suggests uh, that an aberrant group behavior among Blacks began in 1710 and were formalized into law when the Virginia colon colonial government introduced a meritorious uh, manumish, uh, manumish <laughs> can't pronounce the shit, manumish, uh, says a public policy that was used. Uh, I'm sorry, my bad. No, no, no go ahead, go ahead. Uh, that's the um, the Meritorious Manumissions Act of 1718. Man so, oh. Manumission. Oh, okay, I got you. Manumission says a public policy that was used to condition and instill, instill internal controls into the psyche of enslaved Blacks. The practice reward Blacks who saw slavery through the eyes of white society were willing to work against their own group's best interests and inform on members of their race who were planning to escape and free other Blacks. This social engineering effectively destroyed most Black people, Black people's sense of community, thus, and, and uh, oh, sorry about trust and accountability. Through undocumented, many, uh, though undocumented, many Black Americans believe that soon after its inception, meritorious manumissions was merged into what we know or what we now call Willie Lynchism. According to the popular belief, Willie Lynch came to Jamestown, Virginia in 1712, offering a mind controlling ideology to destroy black people's sense of community. A professional slave trainer, Willie Lynch offered the slave owners or the slaveholders a conditioning system that guaranteed, that he guaranteed will instill internal controls that would effectively divide blacks for centuries. He proposed that slave masters, uh, slave masters create divisions among blacks and separate them along lines of gender, age, tribe, culture, class, rank, and skin color. To this day, the effects of Willie Lynchism continues to encourage black individualism, selfishness, and self-hatred. Uh, since though slavery and Jim Crow semi-slavery officially ended in 1865 and 1954, respectively, no formal records are known to have been kept that examine the principles and techniques involved in the conditioning process. If our goal is to build functional communities, we can, however, understand the techniques and methods that were used to destroy our sense of community. We can more fully understand what happened if we analyze a similar and better documented mind, mind control experiment that occurs during the Korean War of the 1950s. And this is meritorious manumissions and brainwashing. So let me get this one. Hold on, let me pull up a little, little uh, diagram here. All right. So both American soldiers held in North, uh, in North Korean prisoners of war uh, camps during the 1950s and enslaved black people were, psycho uh, were psychologically or were social, uh, what is that? Oh, psychologically and physiologically manipulated in parallel ways. The communist North Korean army and the Chinese con uh, consorts used both, uh, used brainwashing on American soldiers, slavery use conditioning. Since the biggest difference between the two systems 
was the extreme physical cruelty of slavery. Both systems were designed to tear people apart. In many ways, communist brainwashing was a combination of moratorious manumission and Willie Lynchism. It was a sophisticated form of re-education that operated like group therapy runs in reverse. It says, but unlike group therapy intended to bring people together, communist brainwashing and moratorious manumission were uh, designed to drive people apart from one another. The larger purpose of this social conditioning system was to destroy the ability of the subjects to form natural groups of com natural groups and communities, develop normal relationships, support, protect, and commu communicate with members of their own group. So table two, let me get that table back up that I just had up. Table two offers a brief comparative analysis of the brainwashing of the military captives in the, in the North Korea and China over the three-year period and the mandatorious manumission policies of Willie Lynchism imposed on Blacks for several centuries. The table compares the similarities between the goals, the psychological principles, rewards, punishments, and resultant uh, behavior changes. The results of the two systems were nearly identical in every respect, but in each instance, the subject identified with their oppressors and were often unwilling to return to their former communities to be with their own people. The brainwashed POWs to survive were hospitalized and deprogrammed. No such ther uh, therapy has ever been given to Black Americans. And we'll skip over, we'll uh, flip over to our next part, brainwashed for life. Brainwashed for life. Simply put, brainwashing was an intensive program of de dehumanization, physical degradation, re-education, and indoctrination. The North Korean com communists, much like Willie Lynch, were not simply interested in controlling the POWs while they were in prison camps. They wanted to create humans who would permanently see the world through the eyes of a captor, even after they were quote unquote free and quote unquote integrated back into everyday American society. Both systems were enormously successful. Like black slaves, the imprisoned soldiers were captured, transported into a hostile country, made a quote unquote minority in their segregated prison communities and made total totally dependent upon their captors for the basic necessities of life. Dependence e eventually bloomed into indebtedness. The POWs were grateful to their captors for a few kindnesses, such as occasional extra food, an apple, a piece of candy, or an extra blanket. These extras from their oppressors were little different from the welfare, food stamps, and public housing subsidies that present day blacks receive. And like the white overclass of today, the Korean guards reduced or totally eliminated a benefit when displeased with POW's behavior. The power exercised by the guards and the powerlessness of the POWs themselves constantly reinforced the cycle of despair and suffering. Korean brainwashing broke the will of highly trained soldiers so that they had no interest in trying to escape. It destroyed the PS POW's trust, code of conduct, and sense of connection to their captured comrades. Most choose to become, most chose to become turncoats and remained with their captors after release. Meritorious manumissions and Willie Lynchism had nearly the identical effect on black slaves and their descendants. The conditioning broke their will. Only a few thousand uh, or of more than five million slaves ever attempted an escape. Out of 252 known slave revolts, a black informed nearly every time. That means 
uh, a snitch uh, talked about the slave revolt every time. Ironically, on the eve of the Civil War, over 6,000 blacks were slaveholders. Many fought with the Confederacy to maintain slavery. Some even elected to stay with the white slave masters after the war was over. The analysis of, bra of brainwashing provides insight into why blacks avoid blackness and lack accountability to members of our team. Social integration is disintegration. Throughout the centuries, social engineering, especially integration, has led blacks to destroy their own group solidarity. Social integration reinforced the practice and destroyed black communities and sense of community. Increasingly, blacks are viewing social integration in America as a failure. It is a form of tokenism. It has given black Americans limited access to resources and institutions within mainstream society. It gave one hand, it gave with one hand and took back with the other hand. Blacks now own control, blacks now own and control less than they did in 1954 before the integration process began. Blacks gave up their own businesses, educational institutions, political leadership, culture, and quasi-communities. By comparison, approximately 90% of all Asians, Arabs, and Hispanics in America immigrated within the last 30 years following the end of the Black Civil Rights Movement and have economically surpassed Blacks. Each group owns and controls more income, wealth, and business than 99% of Black Americans who have been in America for centuries. The Civil Rights Movement and social integration opened the nation's doors of wealth and power to everyone except Black people. Once the majority society consented to integrate Blacks, whites began a quote-unquote scorched earth policy, end quote intentionally destroying large urban cities, abandoning them and cannibalizing their industries, businesses, and other wealth producing entities. They use the authority of urban renewal policies to drive expressways through the most prosperous black businesses, districts, and communities throughout the nation. The majority society has forced Blacks to bear the burdens associated with the integration process. Whites frequently complain that Blacks are too race conscious. In fact, their inappropriate behavior patterns indicate that they have not been race conscious. When integration destroyed Black businesses, uh, Black business communities, Black consumers commuted to white suburban malls and started spending approximately 95% of their annual disposable income outside of their own communities. Black colleges were converted to miniature white colleges. Black seeking education, jobs, homes, and leadership were forced to turn to the majority white society. Integration has built in unofficial quota system of five to 8% sometimes called the tipping point, to ensure that Blacks will always be a powerless, non-controlling minority in white communities, businesses, schools, and public offices. Once the Black percent reaches 5 to 8 percent, whites became fearful of losing their majority status and control over Blacks. They sell their homes, move their businesses, and transfer their children to all white schools. Typically, a situation where whites are the majority and blacks are the minority is described as quote-unquote racial balance. 
Social integration opted blacks into practicing individualism rather than group solidarity and group competitiveness. Individualism is the perfect ideological weapon to defend the group privilege that each generation of whites inherits over blacks. Individualism gives what appears to be a reasonable explanation for black underachievement. Further, it provides a responsive and neutral justification for opposing any compensatory or compensatory or preferential treatment for blacks while protecting the pol political and economic group interests of whites. By ignoring racism, individualism maintains the racial status quo. It argues the emancipation, integration, affirmative action, or even reparations for blacks are wrong because government would be called upon to support the rights of a group over the revered rights of individuals. Table three shows the placement of blacks in terms of group competitiveness and consciousness. While white Europeans, Americans, and blacks are individualistic, Asians, Middle Easterners, and Latins practice groupism, stressing solidarity, working together for the common good, of the family and community. Table three shows that if any group is out of place, it is black America at the bottom of column one. Due to special conditioning, black Americans view the concept of individualism through the eyes of European white society. This puts most blacks at odds with their own group's interests. All the population groups in column one are considered white, except black Americans. Black America mistakenly placed a higher value on individual achievement and merit as opposed to group achievement. We surrender our competitive advantages to group oriented immigrants who enter and dominate black business areas and outcompete blacks for jobs and educational and social opportunities. Black America will continue to suffer a double loss, losing out to groups identified in both column one and column number two, as long as there is a gap between our ideology and the reality of our predicament. Our value is misplaced. We should not be the individualistic column we will remain outside and underneath the European white societies until we develop a coherent group orientation and identity. When blacks act as individuals rather than as a group, it is easier for the majority society to control and manipulate them. It also brings comfort to whites because it lowers their fear of blacks as a group competitor. Blacks are further misled by our celebrity culture. In our celebrity culture, the status assigned to popular blacks gives the illusion that blacks are judged and accepted based upon individual achievement rather than the acceptability of the group and community to which they cosmetically belong. All right, elements of functional communities. Now that we have identified some of the major menaces and impediments to building black communities, let's begin to design the kind of communities that we want and need. These communities must be built to overcome all the previous mentioned destructive elements. In the following pages, we will pre pre uh, present designs for physical and human communities that can reverse the effects of centuries of, self, of social conditioning. The first thing we must do is convert residential neighborhoods into functional communities that contain three key elements or operate, operating systems. First, 
They should have the independent. They should have an independent economy that is wholly owned, that is wholly owned by residents of the community and provide consumer products, services, businesses and employment opportunities. Second, they should have an active code of conduct and group accountability. Third, they should have a form of governance that collectively speaks for the residents and is capable of applying political pressure to outside groups. Let's elaborate more on each of these elements. Independent economy. Not one black neighborhood in America has a black business economy upon which its members can depend to supply its residents with their daily necessities, products, services, or jobs. As stated earlier, the civil rights movements of the 1960s was destructive to urban black communities in many aspects. Black America would have been in a much would have been much better off had the movement equipped blacks to be their own jobs, to be their own jobs and product producers rather than seekers for jobs and products of others. If blacks had become production oriented rather than consumer, rather than consumption consumption oriented, there is little likelihood that today they would have they would have a hidden national unemployment rate of 34% and live in neighborhoods rather than communities. Today, black neighborhoods are totally dependent upon whites and other competing groups to supply the product, services, and employment needs of black neighborhoods. The other part is the, so we're elaborating on the uh, four aspects of those three parts. So the next one is code of conduct and group accountability. The code of conduct is a standard of behaviors that outlines what is right and wrong within and outside the community. It serves as a competitive tool to promote group unity and accountability by suggesting either reward or punishment for its members based upon how their acts help or hurt the members of the group. The burdens for establishing and reinforcing a code of conduct typically fall upon the shoulders of the community's basic institutions, the church, family, and school. A code of conduct does several things for the community. First, as a system or a collection of rules, it prescribes and justify how blacks should think, see, and behave with other individuals and groups. These rules can be, oh, these rules can be explicit or implicit, but uh, either way, they act they act to govern individual behavior that affects a group. A code of conduct is necessary to keep our to keep out the destructive behaviors that is often evident in black neighborhoods. Moreover, wealth and power can be built only where there is an enforceable code of conduct. Code of conduct can define inappropriate behaviors and impede and all it says and impedes it. It also rewards behavior that, is, that uplifts and strengthens the groups. Any group that is characterized by self-hate, a lack of group self-interest, disorganization, and other social pathologies must, must implement a code of conduct in order to build and organize society and maintain an infrastructure that, uh, that includes school, healthcare, healthcare systems, and other human uh, services. Once a code of conduct has been has been articulated, it should be adopted and communicated through schools, neighborhood organizations, churches, and families, so that it reaches all the residents. It must not only become a guide to uh, to appropriate behavior, but also a guide towards accountability and the development of penalties for inappropriate behaviors. The code of conduct should be carefully thought to be uh, oh should be carefully taught to black children, so that each generation will know what to expect of it to what is to what is expected of it. Among other things, black youth need to know how they should treat other members of their families and community, how to conduct themselves at school, in church, or in a community, and how to show respect for themselves their property, 
as well as the property of others. Man, that's some good shit right there. All right. A code of conduct must effectively discourage Sambo behavior that was once known as Uncle Tomism. This kind of behavior is extremely detrimental to the community to community building. It is nearly impossible to eliminate because dominant society rushes to reward it. Samboism is a means of social control that extends all the way back to slavery. The majority society has always needed a few blacks who would sell out their race for their own personal gains. The practice of Samboism has continued for more than a century after slavery ended because there is still not a prescribed code of conduct that either forbids that it forbids it or imposes consequence to those who engage in it as a means of selling out their race. The consequences for Samboism can vary from social sanctions to economic penalties. In some cities, black activist uh, black activist communities or community organizations post the pictures of Sambos on yardsticks and billboards. Others uh, publicly issue Sambo certificates and Hayward Shepherd Awards. Hayward Shepherd uh, was a black man who was killed by John Brown, by John Brown's uh, raiding party for trying to warn the town of Harps of uh, the Harts Ferry, Virginia. It says uh, the Harts Ferry, Virginia, uh, that raiders were there to free black slaves. Damn, that's crazy as hell. It says the punishment for violating code for violating code and behavior standards must be sure and sh- must be sure and swift. It is important that every member of the community understands that community will enforce the code and protect itself. A code of conduct would be necessary to communicate new team standards. Some blacks have behaved in their individual self-interest when they perceive disorganizations, self-destructive behavior, and mixed signals among blacks to mean that they were that there was no functioning skin uh, color team. Those who choose to change their behavior, to re-identify with the team, and to take a part in helping the group achieve self-sufficiencies and competitiveness would need a code of conduct as a guide to new behavior. It can show those who have positions and celebrity status in sports, entertainment, corporate America, our government, how to how to benefit and strengthen the group, social and political governance. Lastly, a functional black community should have a structure of social and political governance that regulates community institutions and represent the collective interests of the community. All across America, black neighborhoods are administered and governed by whites, even in cities where blacks elect elected officials are already in place. Says whites set the rules, blacks are expected to obey. This pattern of dominance was achieved uh, with the full knowledge and support of both black and white societies. Once blacks get into a stronger position, they should not allow whites or any other group to represent them in competitive situations. To do this so constitutes a conflict of interest, however, for the movement with white control, where white control all the where whites control all the institutions within black neighborhoods, they derive the benefit of authority, income, jobs, and benefit opportunities from governing in both white and black communities. Moreover, they determine what services black people receive and the products or opportunities that exist within black neighborhoods. It is now imperative that blacks put themselves in position socially and politically to represent and be responsible for their own community. This will not be easy. Even when blacks are uh, are duly and legally elected to public office, they often do not make governing decisions that are in the best interest of their black of their black constituents. Once in office, they often become sensitive. Oh, yeah, often become sensitive to approval rating and the need to for re-election funds for re-election funds. 
since blacks rarely conduct polls or vote based on criteria other than popularity and have little money for campaign contributions, Blacks seeking or holding public office find it more advantageous to secure the approval of white society. They believe white dollars will, will come to them while they are in office as, uh, as well as when they leave uh, public service. They harbor no such, uh, no such notion about black dollars. One moment. In the case of the uh, black elected officials, they are restricted from assisting the black communities because they do not control uh, public or public resources. The dominant society makes sure that public resources follow the control of white elected officials. Protecting their own best interests, they do not want to uh, want the levers of control in black hands. Uh, since most know or suspect that it is easier to uh to ideology uh to ideology uh damn I'm jacking that off easier to ideology ideologically and politically control and economically exploit disorganized blacks who lack both physical communities and a strong sense of community. Andrew Hacker in his book Two Nations discuss how whites fear blacks and hold a strong belief that political control should never be surrendered to black people. Under this system of white domination, black elected officials' uh, political power is mostly symbolic. With holding controls of public resources from black officials is a standard operating procedure. Blacks will not voluntary will not voluntary be given control regardless of whether the city's uh, black population is a as a majority minority or the majority without tangible resources and power it is nearly impossible for the properly uh intentioned black elected official or black communities to compete and here we go into nationalism and pluralism since nationalism and pluralism, nationalism are, and pro oh is that on you no no that, that was on me Wait, because we, we was doing the two, right? Wait, let me see. Yeah, because you finished off, uh, wait, which one you finished off? Social integration and decent, uh, yeah, this one was just long. So okay. this, yeah, this one on me right here. Uh, since uh, nationalism and pluralism allows millions of ethnic immigrants to compete uh, as a group, they have the potential to do the same for blacks. Devotion to one's own cultural group. Our nation is called na uh, nationalism. Nationalism helps groups build community, mobilize for power, and control resources. It allows cultural groups to function as a nation within a nation. Black Americans are a nation within a nation, but have never behaved in a matter uh, consistent with the reality. In our pluralistic society, many groups are nationalistic. They form their own, they form their nations of peoplehood based on common underlying characteristics from skin color to language. Nationalism is based upon a sense of community and can make it easier for blacks to build a cohesive group within the nation. As an excluded nation living on the margins of American societies, blacks have marched, prayed, and fought to be accepted into the mainstream society. They have wanted to be a part of the nation rather than to be a nation. Ain't both of these alone. Says blacks uh, need to emerge and begin to compete based upon the uh, reality of where they are. They are, oh, since they are an obsolete labor class that is reluctant to build and live in their own communities. Unlike blacks, Europeans, European ethnic groups built work, learn, and thrive in their, in their individual respective ethnic communities up until the end of World War II. Then they proclaimed their whiteness, abandoned their ethnic communities, and assimilated into the, white, into the majority white society that helped fend off the civil rights uh, movement, push for social integration. Thus today, there is solid white unity amongst Germans, Italians, English, Polish, Greeks, and other ethnic groups on racial matters and black people. 
New ethnic, group, new ethnic immigrants are exercising an old assimilation options. Arab Asians, Eastern Europeans, and Hispanics are building and maintaining their own ethnic communities again. Ethnic enclaves and black nationalism. First generation of ethnic immigrants typically build their own independent communities before assimilating into the larger society during the second generation. They remain their own ethnic communities as social economic uh, alternatives. A second generation Chinese, Arab, and Hispanic person can always go back to his ethnic uh, community if he feels rejected by other whites. Whether they practice separation or assimilation, ethnic immigrants openly demonstrate the advantage of the ethno aggregation and, na and nationalism. Nationalism gives them an eternal sense of peoplehood and cultural base. It also, uh, also, it also functions as an umbilical cord to their network of community and their countries of origin. These communities have served the political and economic needs of American ethnic immigrants for centuries. On the other hand, white America is threatened by any form of competitive black nationalism. Whites prefer blacks remain unchanged, the models of patriotism and democratic principles. They want black people to be passive and captive consumers who live in black neighborhoods and remain out of, out of sight and out of mind. Nationalism and pluralism can help blacks build independent communities as well as promote their own self-interest. All major population groups in America except Blacks practice a form of nationalism, although they do not publicly call it nationalism as indicated. And let me get this other figure. In figure eight, nationalism is practiced whenever a, rat, whenever a racial or ethnic group is devoted to do, I mean, to and act on behalf of its interests of its own cultural group or nation, Spanish speaking groups, under labor, um, oh, sorry, under the label of Latino and Hispanics, practice nationalism by attempting to build a nation within America using the Spanish language to empower them to rights, space, and power. Jews, uh, Mormons, and the Amish, <clears throat> and the Amish are example are example groups who have used their religion to establish a peoplehood and nationalistic identity. Chinatown, Frenchtown, and Polish town are cultural enclaves built on strong sense of peoplehood and nationalism. American Indian tribes are cultural and ethnic, uh, also in ethnic groups that feel a sense of peoplehood and pride themselves on being a nation within a nation. More than any group, the majority white society has always been a race-based group with pride in its European nationalism and patriotism. And it says, as started, as uh, stated earlier, Black Americans remain the exceptions, but not totally by choice. Black Americans are without a sense of peoplehood and community and tend to be afraid of Black nationalism and Afrocentrism simply because the uh, majority uh, white society is also afraid. Though Black Americans, and possibly more than any other group, have both the right and justification to be nationalistic. They have consistently elected not to be. Aggregation in urban cities. A great competitive advantage for black Americans is the fact that they currently sit on some of the most valuable and best located real estate, whether they are called inner cities or urban ghettos. Since blacks are the dominant population in a large number of cities, practicing ethno aggregation and vertical integration can easily convert these areas into prime black businesses, communities with just a little stretch of the imagination and capital. Most of these areas already have blacks in a political office. Using blacks, using black accountability Voters could easily mobilize to remove the politicians who operate from self-interest 
and a non-black perspective. Their replacement should be committed new leadership that will mobilize resources and practice majority win politics. Table four shows a partial list of cities that blacks can convert into communities where black economic and political empowerment can thrive. Since blacks are the dominant population in major cities, they have the political potential to build major industries and establish vertical control. In the cities listed in the third column of, of table four, blacks make up less than the dominant population and should use ethno aggregation and vertical integration to build alternative structures of quote unquote maroon towns. This is an inappropriate historic name for these communities. When enslaved blacks escaped from the plantation and into the woods, they joined with other black runaways and built independent and self-sufficient communities that they called maroon towns. Inside each black minority cities, blacks have sufficient resources to build at least one major maroon town with its own business center, center, uh, centers or street malls. Also, there are suburban neighborhoods across America that could be converted into visible self-sufficient black communities instead of simply remaining black neighborhoods. For example, Prince George's County in Maryland has the honor of being the wealthiest black neighborhood in America. As a suburb of Washington, DC, it has attracted blacks out of the district and now has the highest concentration of the most educated blacks in America. Yet, it remains simply a residential area where some of the, this nation's wealthiest blacks merely eat and sleep. They did not build a community that was self-sufficient and competitive economically. There are at least 21 black municipalities that could easily be transformed from residential neighborhoods to functional communities. Most of these municipalities, such as Inglewood and Richmond, California, either have black majorities or elected bodies where blacks make up the majority. Other smaller cities such as Highland Park and Benton Harbor, Michigan and Gary, Indiana are approximately 80% black. With visionary leadership and a can-do attitude, blacks could convert these economically and politically weak neighborhoods into competitive communities. Rebuilding can begin by staking out competitive space on which to build and operate. With the Black Civil Rights Movement, ran, when, the Black, when the Black Civil Rights Movement ran its course, urban Blacks exercised newfound social freedoms by integrating into previously all white suburbs, businesses, and schools. Upwardly mobile, middle-class Blacks abandon Black cities to establish Black neighborhoods in white suburbs, subsequently surrendering control of their property, institutions, and culture. As Blacks began to rebuild their physical communities and establish economic control of inner cities, they will surely clash with whites and ethnic immigrants. Whites are seeking to retake the old urban areas under a new gentrification concept called, quote unquote, regionalization. Regionalization allows whites to hold onto their suburban territories while their majority legislative bodies push suburban legal boundaries into urban areas and bring them under one regional government controlled by whites. Under regionalization, whites seek to control all government, public institutions, and properties. They recently discovered that it was a mistake to abandon the urban cities to blacks following the civil rights movement. The whites have 
cannibalize the cities, the locations themselves and their remaining infrastructures are still valuable. The wealthy and power elite want them back. If whites are successful in retaking black neighborhoods and cities, blacks will be back where they were a century ago. They will own and control nothing. Worse, they will have to compete with new ethnic immigrants as well as whites for space in cities like Detroit. Many black elected officials in black cities are co-conspirators in regionalization. They invite whites to reverse that outward migration of the 1960s and come back into the cities. Black elected officials give away their city's assets, prime property, privatized public services, control over the schools, court systems, and public water and sewage plants to draw whites back into black cities. Scant rewards, incentives, or special programs are devised to empower blacks who live in those communities. Only a few black public officials are trying to hold on to their neighborhoods and control of government. It is clear by their actions that whites are determined to regain ownership and control of the power, land, and resources in the cities. The same whites who work to keep control of black assets criticize the way blacks live and would never allow conditions similar to those in black neighborhoods to exist in their communities. Black America must build and maintain communities to satisfy its own needs, not the economic and political needs of whites and other groups that want unrestricted access to their neighborhoods. Black neighborhoods should first and foremost be for black people. When I articulated this concept on national radio, a white gentleman called in and said he felt white and ethnic immigrants ought to have a right to make their living in black neighborhoods. This caller missed the point. There is no disagreement that non-blacks have a right to establish businesses in black neighborhoods, but blacks have the same rights that whites and other groups have to withhold economic support when they choose. Black Americans will get more respect and economic and political power if they do not support any business or ethnic group that engages in practices adverse to Blacks. No law or public policy can make Blacks spend their money in non-Black-owned businesses. If it were illegal to boycott, then nearly all of white America and its ethnic subgroups would be liable for contravention of the law since they have boycotted and exploited black neighborhoods and black businesses for centuries. Boundary maintenance. An important task in building new black communities is establishing and maintaining community boundaries. It is a common sight to see animals mark their territory. Humans operate at a higher level, but they too establish boundaries, lines then mark them. The majority society closes com communities using markers such as skin color, religion, ethnicity, and languages. Community markings also vary with the, the wealth and political clout of the group. Those with the greater wealth and political clout will typically have more prominent markings. Wealthy communities are marked and closed by signs, gates, and security guards. Ethnic communities such as Chinatowns are marked symbolically often by oriental gates. Koreatown and Little Havana are marked and closed by flags and a foreign language. 
Hispanics claim and mark space in closed communities using the Spanish language. As a society becomes increasingly pluralistic, groups stake out, mark, and close their turf. That is every group except Black America. Black America can build communities, but to keep them and have them achieve their objectives, they ought to be marked and closed. Marking is one of the first practices that we should institute as a part of our code of conduct once our communities are up and doing business. We must mark our communities the way other groups do. By marking our communities, we send the message that these communities belong to us. Today, there are no positive signs that identify black neighborhoods and say, quote unquote, this is ours. When black Americans begin to mark territory, it does not mean that others are unwelcome any more than when Arabs, Chinese, or Hispanics mark their communities. Do the pagodas in China mean that non-Chinese cannot enter? To the contrary, marked boundaries invite all to come, but primarily as customers and visitors. We have figure nine, protecting the hood. Language is an index of culture. It is routinely used by immigrant groups to mark and close their communities. Language is a unifying element and it allows native speakers to do business within the community while limiting others. It brings status and importance to the people, culture, and the community. Visitors to Chinatown, Koreatown, Little Saigon, or any other culturally strong communities might feel some discomfort because they do not speak the language. Other often feel resentful because they feel this is America and everyone should be speaking English, the national language. Public laws in some cities such as Miami require that all public announcements be in both English and Spanish. Most of the public notices, businesses signs, Newspapers and advertisements are in Spanish. Immigrant enclaves like the Hispanic and Asian communities of today are very much aware that they are marking and closing their communities. Cubans are an example of a group that use language to mark and close their community and to gain competitive advantages. The first major influx of Cubans began to arrive in this country in the late 1960s. They soon acquired major control of both the private and public sectors of Dade County and Miami, Florida. In one of their first acts of power, they enacted a city ordinance that declared Miami a bilingual city. Non-Spanish speaking people had to learn Spanish to interact with Cuban communities. Millions of dollars are now earmarked to print public information in both English and Spanish. Even the Miami Herald publishes a daily newspaper that is primarily bilingual. Most businesses and public jobs require a facility with Spanish. Blacks who previously held most of the hotel and lower level city jobs were fired because they did not speak Spanish. Cubans and others demanded bilingual education classes for all students while using the Spanish language to mark and close their communities. Since blacks do not have an official language, they cannot use language to mark and close their communities to competing groups. The language disadvantage of Blacks was revealed in the Ebonics issue in Oakland, California toward the end of the 1990s. 
the local school board had requested federal bilingual funds to teach English to black children who spoke Ebonics. Not only were they turned down at the federal level, they incurred the wrath of many blacks and black leaders who saw no value in recognizing black language. The Oakland debacle illustrates the bigger problem blacks face. If they had maintained their communities, built a business structure that provided their people jobs and wealth building opportunities, their children could have had the same advantages accorded ethnic immigrants. They could have remained in their communities for the rest of their lives, speaking Ebonics or any other language of their choosing. Instead, black children are required to meet the language standards of immigrant communities because they are the largest, if not the only group of Americans who regularly abandon their own people and communities to live with other groups in their communities. Black communities are vulnerable and unmarked. They do not have gates, signs, or other markers or barriers. They are wide open to transit traffic and activities from outsiders. Open black communities are prime targets for those who wish to exploit blacks economically and politically. Unclosed black communities are vulnerable to toxic waste and illegal activities such as drugs, prostitution, fencing, and gambling. The black residents are not sufficiently organized to deal with these illegal activities, which are typically controlled by powerful forces outside of black communities. Open communities can not control the goods and services within them. Competing groups can enter, confiscate, and exploit the host community. They can control black politicians, start competitive businesses that drain off capital, self inferior products or commit acts that are injurious to the local residents, a, res a residential neighborhood cannot protect or sustain itself until it becomes a functional community. Levels of functional yeah. community. Once we have put together the elements for a functional community, an independent economy, a code of conduct, and a form of government, our team now has a foundation from which to compete politically and economically. We, we become more familiar with each other and can rally around our collective needs, experiences, and goals. We can now begin to move our communities to higher levels of functioning as illustrated in figure 10 below. Our paradigm of vertical integration can be applied to community development. Vertical community development establishes a common sense of direction, authority, and collective interest. Members of the community live by a code of conduct based upon principles that dictate how they relate to, care for, respect, and support each other. Once people have confidence that others in the community can be relied upon to help and support them, a sense of mutual trust evolves and cooperation can follow. Humans cooperate with people they have learned to trust. Once people are cooperating, they then have the capability to hold members of the group accountable for their behavior. All members of a community cannot be relied upon to live by a code of conduct alone. Some will determine, or excuse me, some will undermine and sell out the community. They will not contribute to its collective development or support blackness. A functional community must have a means to protect itself 
and to hold its members accountable. Other groups have always formal and informal mechanisms to reward or punish members of the group who intentionally engage in behavior that is inappropriate and injurious to the community. Black America must have some institutional community organizations that will hold members accountable to the code of conduct. With the community developing trust, cooperation, and accountability, as indicated in figure 10, black people will be able to function as a competitive team in the marketplace. Conclusion. The success of our national empowerment plan to a, de to a great degree depends upon our ability to build, mark, and close physical communities and develop mindsets that connect us to one another. Integration destroys communities. It does not build them. Community building is organized around people with common goals who appreciate and recognize each member's contribution to the overall group's goals. A competitive community is one that operates upon competitive advantages. Within our national networks, we must build competitive communities that contain social, political, economic, religious, educational, and geographic, geographic assets that act as foundations of power. Communities are uh, repositories for black assets. The Poweronomics National Plan offers research and strategies to build functional communities, but the work of implementing the strategies is necessarily a local function. Some neighborhoods will be able to use out-of-box thinking and mobilize for change. Others will talk about what they should do and not progress much beyond this uh, discussion. Some neighborhoods and communities will never even get the discussion, uh, get to the discussion stage. Each black neighborhood should articulate a common set of beliefs and values regarding taking business risk, making a commitment to saving and investment, striving to achieve uniformly high educational standards, abiding by a code of personal and group conduct, and supporting a trust system a team spirit, ethos on group, uh, says ethos and group uh, self-interest. The primary obligation of a community is to equip, it, to, to equip its members to live and compete successfully, successfully in the domestic and global society of today and tomorrow. Those community members who are able to make this work will become the new black leaders because they will know how to apply the poweronomics vision in order to achieve empowerment. Man, and that's all we got for this chapter three. Thank you guys for stopping in and we'll get on chapter three tomorrow. Any final words, Tank? Man, just another beautiful day, brother. Uh, great chapter three. Look forward to chapter four. Uh, salute to uh, uh, all the brothers uh, who came to the chat. Um, uh, Mr. Vegas, um, Brothers UK, D. Hodges, um, you know what I'm saying? We see y'all and um, salute to y'all and anybody else listening on the playback, salute to y'all as well. And uh, man, let's get in this book. And uh, other than that, peace. And I'll see y'all in the barbershop tonight. Yes, indeed. See you guys in the barbershop, man. But that's all we got. Thanks for rocking with us. If you have the book, you can come and join us as we go page by page, line by line, getting through this book and also putting into the minds and also want to make reading a normal thing. So we go about doing our own research, looking through different documents that are out there, making book suggestions, and we'll get them on here and we're going to read through them. As grown men, we can influence the young adults who see this and they, you know, they're always watching us and they'll view this as being something cool. King uh, Israel in the building as well. Salute my brother. Brothers UK says, well, well read, bro. Indeed. Salute, salute, uh, King Israel. Uh, shalom, brother. Uh, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Brothers UK, man, I see you in here every night, too. And we're going to get to the book that you said, too, because I got that one, and I believe Reggie has that one as well, uh, Black Labor, White Wealth. You got that one, Reg? 
So we can we're gonna go through as much as we can because our goal, like Reggie said, is we want to make uh, reading cool. We want to make reading real cool again, and uh, we want to put it into um, our young brown and black brothers and sisters that uh, there's a lot of information in these books. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, pulling a book out, reading the book, uh, getting the information out of the book that you can uh, use to apply to better yourselves and elevate the mindset of yourself and the people around you. So uh, that's why we're doing this. You know what I mean? Uh, me and Reggie uh, got together and we was talking in one of the other uh, uh, panels a while back. And, you know, what I'm saying I just started bringing up reading and making reading cool again because, you know, working with uh, young black and brown uh, um students, um, I, I did get to, uh, I got to notice that they didn't even like to read. And so once I would come uh, to the classroom and they would see me reading, uh, they would be like, well, what you reading? Oh, that's why you always on the, on, on the stuff that you on. Oh, that's why you speak the way you speak. And another thing that reading does, it expands our vocabulary as well as our understanding so that when we go out into different um, avenues as we're reading this book to build a community and vert vertically integrate we want to be able to speak uh, in a way that um, everyone can understand us and not just kind of view us and put us in a box because they view us as uh, a people who uh, cannot speak intelligently. So um, these, all these things sharpen our, our, our mind and sharpen our, our intellect and help elevate us as uh, individuals and people. So with that, I say salute and we appreciate anybody that comes in here uh, and looks uh, uh, and, and contributes with us live. Like Reggie said, if you got the book, read along, jump on the panel. And uh, those who are watching on the playback, we salute you as well. Yes, indeed. And that's all we got. We up out of here, folks. Peace.